Every hour of every day, we're bombarded by attempts to influence our behavior, what to buy, how to vote, what to click on next. And most of the time, we are completely oblivious to this. As humans, we have psychological triggers that, once activated, make us much more vulnerable to the schemes of marketers, politicians, and anyone else looking to manipulate us, as well as to separate us from our freedoms and our money. We have to watch out for the profiteers, those people, the pirates, the, uh, the people who lie and wait along the, the path of these shortcuts to the right answer uh, because they want to exploit us. Hello, folks. Adam Taggart, founder of Wealthion.com here, welcoming you to a very special interview. Today, we're being joined by Dr. Robert Cialdini, famously known as the godfather of influence. He's a New York Times bestselling author, and he's the Regents Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Marketing at Arizona State University. Uh, Bob's books include Influence and Persuasion. He's sold more than 7 million copies in 44 different languages. Um, he's known globally as the foundational expert in the science of influence and how to apply it ethically in business. His six principles of persuasion have become a cornerstone for any organization seriously about uh, increasing their influence. Bob, I'm, I'm just so thrilled you can join us today. I, I've got to admit to some hero worship here. Your work has really shaped the way I see the world. It's an honor to have you here on the program. Well, that's very gratifying to hear, Adam. I appreciate it. Well, thanks. And I presume for folks who aren't familiar with your work, you're going to be one of their heroes as well after we have this conversation. Um, so let's get right into it here. Um, uh, I'm really interested in this conversation of getting to how we can recognize and defend ourselves from the bombardment of daily attempts, both overt and surreptitious, to influence our behavior. But first, for those who might be unfamiliar with your work, can you explain why we humans are so susceptible to these attempts to influence us? Yes, and it has to do with the fact that most of the time, these principles of influence that I talk about steer us correctly. They provide us ec excellent counsel as to when to say yes to a request, proposal, recommendation that we receive uh, because uh, they, and because they do, then those individuals who want to move us in their direction harness the power of those principles to get us to move in that direction. And most of the time, if they have honestly pointed to one or another of these tendencies that we typically uh, take in order to increase our outcomes, uh, they will have steered us correctly, but we have to watch out for the profiteers, those people, the pirates, the, uh, the people who lie and wait along the, the path of these shortcuts to the right answer uh, because they want to exploit us ma by manufacturing or fabricating uh, those principles. Great. And uh, I, I know in your book, Influence, you talk about, um, you call it the click were response. But these yeah. are these are shortcuts, as you're saying. They're, they're ways in which we make decisions quickly um, because they work for us 99% of the time. Um, but to your point, these, these you know, potential pirates um, can, if they understand that code, they can learn how to crack it and basically use those shortcuts against us, almost like a, like a computer hacker will hack a computer. Um, I'll let you expound on this, but, but one example you talk about in your book of this, um, it's in uh, turkeys, uh, not humans, but it's similar to some of the responses that humans have where turkeys and polecats, which basically a weasel, um, they are just natural enemies. And if a turkey, mother turkey sees a polecat, she'll just become enraged and, and try to kill it because she doesn't want it to eat her chicks. Um, so she has this biological response to just destroy the polecat. Um, and her baby chicks, when they make the little cheap noise, she has a strong biological prerogative to care for them. And one of those actually trumps the other, meaning if you put a polecat in with a weasel, sorry, a polecat in with a turkey, and it's got a recorder on it that makes the little cheep of the, the baby chick, the mother turkey, instead of flying into a rage, will actually care for the polecat. So mm -hmm. her, her biological responses are being hacked. And, and to your point, they're so powerful for us. 
if people are able to take advantage of those, um, we can be getting duped without really even being aware of it. Is that correct? It is. <clears throat> Let me give you a human uh, analog to that story. Uh, the word because triggers in us a willingness to accept the next thing we hear because typically a reason follows the word because. And we are programmed to want reasons for what we do. So there's this great study done in a, a, a library at Harvard University where there was a line of people waiting to use the copying machine and a researcher walked up to the, to the front of the line and said, excuse me, uh, could I skip ahead of you because I'm in a rush, right? And 93% of the people said yes, right? Because I'm in a rush. She used uh, another because and added no real reason, right? She said, because I have to make some copies. Well, that's just stating the obvious. Everybody in that <laughs> life has to make some copies. 93% let her go ahead. It was because the word because was used and people responded to that trigger in the same way that mother turkeys respond to the trigger of the cheap, cheap sound that their baby chicks make and pr produce maternal behavior. The word because produces compliant behavior. Well, and what I love about your work, Bob, is once you're exposed to it, you, you sort of see it everywhere. You recognize that we live in a world of attempts to influence our behavior all the time. And just using this because example, you know, if you look at any type of marketing that's out there, it always offers the because or the reason, whether it's a good reason or not, right? So uh, chew Trident gum because four to five dentists recommend it. Right, uh, eat our breakfast cereal because it's fortified with nine essential, you know, vitamins and minerals. Um, L'Oreal, their uh, their tagline is "Because you're worth it," which yes. it doesn't say anything specific, but it's just leveraging that because. So it's a really um, enlightening way uh, to see the world once once the veil has been lifted from your eyes in terms of all of these, you know, principles of science that are being used, as you say, to drive compliant behavior. Um, all right. So, right. so and by the way, I'll say that. It's not all marketing attempts. It's not all advertising efforts. Some forget to use the word because they just show a scene, a positive scene with <clears throat> favorable uh, outcomes or uh, attractive people uh, using their product. They forget the trigger and they sink. Those approaches sink. Well, and so I think this is, you know, a, a testament to the huge value of, of your work and what you've uncovered here, which is it, it provides a blueprint for people who are, who are having trouble maybe in relationships in terms of trying to get people on the same page as they, well, here are ways to try to bridge those gaps more effectively. Or to your point as a business, hey, we're trying to drive consumers to buy our product, use our services, et cetera. Maybe we're not speaking to them as effectively as possible. Let's use some of these tenants here and see, you know, let's audit our marketing and, and make sure that it's actually using these effectively, you know, where are we falling down? Where are we, be, are we being deficient? So this is a great segue into my next question, which is um, in your just truly excellent book, um, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, um, you detail out what you call the six principles of persuasion that science shows us are particularly effective in getting people to engage in the type of behavior that you want. Um, can you do your best just to, to quickly dial through those and summarize each one and why it's important? Yeah, let me do that with an example in each case. The first is the principle of reciprocation. It's a rule that says we are trained from childhood in every human culture, by the way. There's not a single human society that fails to train its members in this rule from childhood, which says, I am obligated to give back to you the form of behavior you have first given to me, right? If you, get, if you invite me to a party, I should invite you to one of mine, and so on, right? But if you do me a favor, I owe you a favor. And I'll say very simply, in the context of obligation, 
people say yes to those they owe. The implication is we have to give first, give benefits, give advantage, advantages, give information, give something of worth, and people will stand on the balls of their feet ready to give back to us. Second principle is one no one would dispute, liking. We prefer to say yes to those people we like. No surprise there. But there are two small things we can do to increase the willingness of people to give us that rapport. One is to point to genuine similarities that exist between us. When that was done in a bargaining experiment, the number of deadlock negotiations Right? When people first gave information to one another that allowed them to see complementary interests and hobbies and so on, the number of, of deadlock negotiations dropped from 30% to 6%. Right? Second thing you can do is give genuine compliments. Not only do we like people who are like us, we, we like people who do like us and say so. <laughs> So, <clears throat> genuine compliments, that's the other. Next principle is the principle of social proof. People say yes to those who can give them evidence that a lot of other individuals like them have been saying yes to this request. So, uh, if you, uh, for example, in, in a study done in McDonald's, if you say to people at the end of their order, would you like to order one of our desserts? Right. Our uh, Frosty, whatever it was, uh, I can't remember, is our most popular. Orders of Frosty go, go up 54% just by telling people what's popular. Next is the principle of authority. People say yes to those who can give them evidence that what they're suggesting is consistent with the voices of genuine experts, authorities, people with credentials and knowledge in the matter. So testimonials from acknowledged experts should always be included in any messaging. And here's where I would once again say, a lot of times the marketers and advertisers get this wrong because they don't put the testimonials at the top of their message. They're buried somewhere in the middle or at the end. The testimonial should go first. So all of the aura of authority infuses every line of what comes next. Right? Next principle is the principle of commitment and consistency. People want to be consistent with what they have already said or done. Right? So in one study in a restaurant, uh, the manager was able to get the number of no-shows at that restaurant to drop significantly by asking his receptionist when she took a booking to say, not just uh, thank you for calling our restaurant, uh, please call us if you have to change uh, or your reservation or cancel. She said, will you please call us? if you have to change or cancel your reservation and waited for a reply. And everybody said, of course. And no shows dropped by 67% because people were on record as making a commitment to that activity. And then they were willing to live up to it to a much greater degree. Next principle is scarcity. People go a little crazy when they think that what something they want or something that's uh, that's uh, attractive is rare or scarce or dwindling in availability to them. So honestly informing people of any dwindling availability of options available or, uh, or products or services is certainly one thing. But the other thing we often forget to do is to tell them what it is about our product or service or idea that is unique, that can't be obtained anywhere else. That's a scarcity manipulation, even for companies that have 
as much information or products or services as there are to request. Tell people what is unique. They can't get anywhere else and then they'll jump in your direction. And there's finally, I've added a seventh principle, the principle uh, the, of unity. The idea that if a communicator can convince an audience that he or she is of them, one of them, a member of a group in which they have a, a, an important social or personal identity, everything within the influence process becomes easier. People say yes to those who are of them, one of them. So for example, there was a study done on a college campus. Uh, the uh, researchers had a young woman, college A woman, looked like a student, uh, standing on campus and as people walked by said, excuse me, would you be willing to donate to the United Way? And she got some form, some level of of uh, contributions. But if she preceded that by saying, I'm a student here too, contributions doubled. Actually, they more than doubled. Just by saying, I'm of you, right, was enough to bring down all the walls against a contribution. All right. Um, God, so many questions and uh, directions I'd like to take the discussion in after uh, all the, that excellent uh, recap you just went through there. The, the key takeaway that I take from it that uh, I really want to make sure viewers take away as well is in pretty much every example you just listed there, Bob, it was an example of a small investment on behalf of the agent uh, that then led to a big action on behalf of the recipient, right? So these are ways in which you can give a little nudge, you know, like you say, you can just add a little phrase, change of phrase a little bit and, you know, double your conversions or, you know, desired actions you want, whatnot. Right. These are ways to sort of nudge the universe. Are, not only are they um, costless in terms of time, they're costless in terms of resources. It, it costs us nothing to add, at, will you, or I'm like you in this, or I'm of you, some kind of message like that. Or the McFlurry is our most popular the dessert. McFlurry, <laughs> that's right, yeah, is our most popular. It, it's, it's one more breath, and you get 54% more spend. So here's the crux of the question that I, I want to ask you on this interview, which is, um, you know, folks, if you haven't read Bob's books, you read them. It's all backed by science and, and the experiments that he's mentioning here. Um, so these little costless, um, you know, uh, they're costless. They don't take much uh, effort on, on behalf of the people that are implementing them, uh, but they yield these big results. Um, they're incredibly effective, as Bob has just described here. Um, Bob, you know, can these, once you understand them, is the danger of this understanding that, that these tenets, these principles can be used either for good or for evil? You know, are there people that are deliberately trying to use these things to manipulate us, either to buy their product or to vote a certain way, um, or to just take behavior that actually is in their best interest, not our own? There is such a danger. It's it's a concern that's beset me since the first time I wrote this, but not because it's unique to the principles of influence. There's no piece of information that can't be corrupted, that can't be twisted, so that it is not just used for good, it is also used for ill. I think about these principles like sticks of dynamite. You can use dynamite to build a bridge, you know, <laughs> or you can use dynamite to blow up a bridge, to destroy a bridge. They can always be used for good or ill. We can't use that fact to eliminate the, the information that we send to the world about how they work how these principles work, how they as human beings work, the readers of this information. So for me, the important thing was to identify what constitutes the ethical use and what constitutes the ethically objectionable use of these principles.
All right. So um, getting into that territory, then, I, I guess, first, are, are there instances slash examples that particularly bother you on the ethical side of things here that you see in the world? Yes. So, for example, let me give you a personal example uh, that came from uh, a, a few years ago. I was in a, uh, I was in an appliance store and I was looking for something else, but my eye was caught by a big screen TV that I knew was very highly rated from consumer reports and was on a drastic sale. And I went in front of it and there were some brochures on the uh, on the counter and I was looking through them and a, a salesperson came up to me and said, I see you're interested in this set. At this price, it's it's a great deal. Uh, I can see why you're interested, but I have to tell you, it's our last one, right? Scarcity. And then he upped the ante by saying, and I just got a phone call from a woman who said she's probably gonna come to the store this afternoon and buy it. You know, I'm supposed to be the doctor of influence. <laughs> but you have your own buttons later, as a woman. <laughs> I'm wheeling out of the store with this set in my cart. Let's let's dis... Uh, because if we disentangle what he did, I think we get to the point that really I want to make about what's ethical and what's not ethical. If he was telling me the truth, that this really was the last of this model. There weren't any back in the storeroom. There weren't any at any other locations. This was it, right? He was my ally in the process. He steered me properly into making an educated, purely, that is, a productively informed decision. If I knew that, Suppose he, this was the last one. It really was the last one. And he didn't tell me. And I went home to think it over and then came back that evening to buy it because I decided I wanted. And he said, oh, sorry, it's our last one. It was our last one. And I sold it to a woman this afternoon. I would have said, what? It was your last one and you didn't tell me? about the true scarcity that applied to this situation? What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> okay, suppose instead <clears throat> it wasn't the last one. He just told me it was to get me agitated and attracted to it to the point where I would buy it. Then he went back to the storeroom and put another one on the shelf and did it again. And here's where I, uh, it, it, my response to your question, have I seen this happen before? It turns out Best Buy employees, the Best Buy store, were caught doing this as a sales strategy a few years ago right? and indicted for it. Right? Okay, so that's the objectionable, objectionable point. Now, which was it? What did Brad, that was his name, the salesman, did he fall on the ethical or unethical side? I went back the next morning after I purchased the set to see if he had put another one in that space on the shelf or if it was truly empty. It was truly empty. Adam. All right. Well, good for Brad. <laughs> yes. So what I say there is I then went and wrote a five-star review for that place and for Brad. That's what... That's what we should do. And that's what we have to look out for. The true use of the principle versus the counterfeit fabricated uses of them. Yep. Well, what I love about that is, is you um, rewarded their uh, integrity on one of the key six principles, uh, scarcity, um, with another one of the principles, actually two of them, which is social proof, right? right. You, you, you wrote the testimonial, but you're also an authority in the field. So you contributed authority as well. That's right. You, you got that right. This is the circle of life of persuasion that we're <laughs> tracking here. Um, I just want to tack onto that, that, that story. That, that was a great way to sort of um, 
lay out the really conundrum we have when we're seeing these principles used in the wild that we, we don't necessarily know the intent of the agent, right? They might be good, like Brad turned out to be, but they might not be. And, and uh, there's a, an example of this that I read in your book that was similar, but I think even more nefarious, which was the, the used car salesman that advertises the too good to be true price on the car. You come in, you take it for a test drive. You're so excited because it's by far the best price you've seen for a car like this. They ask you if you want it. You say, of course, you know, let's get the deal done quickly before you realize what a great deal you're offering me. And then in between the paperwork, they come out and say, gosh, you know, somebody actually put the wrong price on the car. It's actually a lot higher. But for you, we won't give you the full sticker price, but we can't lose money on this car. How about we meet in the middle? And at this point, you've come down to the store, you've taken the test drive with the car, you've told them you love it. So your commitment and consistency has got you locked in. Yes. And you rationalize to yourself, look, am I really going to find a better price for a car like this anyways? And I've done all the work. Okay, I guess I'll take the car. And basically, they have sold you a car that you were not going to buy from them before you saw the fake price that they put out there. So this whole right. transaction has been engineered to manipulate you. Yes, there's, a, there's actually a, a label to that technique. It's called throwing the low ball. That first price is called a low ball. It's below any uh, uh, number that you actually expect to sell the car for. It's to get them to commit to it. And then a lot of times they'll say, oh, take it home for a drive, show it around work, right? And now, you know, you're in, in love with the car, your co-workers think that you've got this new car, and now they're going to take it away? Oh, no, no, no. I've made a commitment to this. All right, so they'll adjust the price up a little bit, but not to the price you would have bought it at in the first place. It's a very effective tactic. It is also against the, the law, by the way. Okay, so... Um... So lots of minefields out here that we need to watch out for. We hope you've been enjoying this conversation with famed psychologist Robert Cialdini. The interview continues in part two, where Robert reveals the best methods for protecting ourselves from the bad actors trying to use the principles of persuasion to manipulate us. To watch part two, just click on the link provided in the description of this video below, or go to youtube.com slash Wealthion. And to make sure you're notified whenever we post a new video to this channel, just click the subscribe button below, as well as the little bell icon right next to it. And in return, if you'd like a no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who is just as passionate as Robert about protecting you and your money from harm, just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you over at part two of our interview with Robert Cialdini. Thank you.